Good morning. What a joy and honor to be with you. Thank you for your part in this wondrous celebration. And on behalf of all of us, I thank the cathedral community for your hard work and artistic care that we might celebrate Easter in such great beauty. I greet you in the name of God, who loves you with an everlasting love, a love that does not let go or give up, love that is patient and kind, love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love, in short, that does not end. May you feel that love today. I greet you in the name of God who shows no partiality, none. There's nothing you or I need do to earn this love, nor can we lose it. It's a love that does not take into account those things that we imagine are what make us worthy or unworthy of love nor does it join us when we divide others into categories of relative value. It doesn't go there. May you feel that lack of partiality for yourself and remember that it extends to all. But I greet you in the name of the risen Christ, whose life could not be contained in death, whom God raised and through whom we also live. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the end how could the end be happy after all that has happened? And we know that if it had been up to us, the story would end badly. For while we are undeniably a gifted and competent species, capable of many grand and inspiring things, resurrection is not in our repertoire. Remarkable as we are, we do not have the power to bring life out of death. Try as we might, we cannot breathe life into dead bones. We cannot restore what has been irretrievably lost. We can't even make the kind of changes in ourselves that we long for. Even with our best intentions, we cannot make resurrection happen. And it's humbling, actually, to come up against so firm a limit, particularly if you are among the spiritually ambitious and sincere. I read a memoir years ago written by a woman who spent a year working very hard at her spiritual life. She did in that year all the things we imagine spiritual, spiritual people do, but that we never have time to get around to ourselves. I'm not clear what she did for a living because she seemed to spend every day at a soup kitchen serving the poor, and she volunteered at her church and showed up at every conceivable worship service. She read spiritual books, thought deeply about her own life, kept a journal, of course, cared for two friends who were dying, supported her priest when he came out as a gay man to a congregation not particularly equipped for that kind of announcement. In short, she did everything she could think of to be a good person, and more than that, a Christ-like person. And she did all those things to great effect. But you know where she was on Easter Sunday? She was sitting on the perch of the baptismal font in the back because she arrived late and all the pews were filled. And why was she, Miss Spirituality of the Year, late on this of all Sundays? 
Well, before church, she got into a very unspiritual fight with her husband. One of those nasty arguments that go nowhere. And worse still, she provoked it out of loneliness. A year's worth of trying to be spiritually exemplary, blowing up in her face, and she was left in raw humanity. There are some things beyond our power to change. But to say that resurrection is not in our repertoire doesn't mean that it's outside of our experience. We know this. We felt its power. It's what, it's what comes to us from somewhere else. It's, it's hard to describe in words, which is why I think scripture tends to give us images instead. Take, for example, the large stone in front of Jesus's tomb this weighty obstacle between the women on their way to care for his body and their task. And we know that stone well, for it embodies all the weight of the world, all the guilt and regret, grief, failure, fear, anxiety. Sometimes we find that very same stone in our path blocking us from where we need to go or what we need to do. Sometimes it actually sits on our shoulders and we buckle under its weight. Or still, sometimes we see it on the shoulders of someone else and no matter how we want to, we, we can't remove it from them. In another version of this story, the women walk toward the tomb, fretting among themselves about this very stone, just as we do about the ones impeding us. And yet, when the women arrived, and this was the first indication that things were changing, this mysterious young man effortlessly had moved the stone before they arrived. And I love this part. For good measure, he sat on it as if to say, I've got this one. It's no longer your problem. Resurrection feels sometimes like, like a stone being removed. You, you can still see it. It's off to the side. You can go up and touch it if you like. You, uh, but unless you actually step in front of it intentionally again, it's no longer in your way. You wake up one morning and you realize that the grief you've been carrying or, or the resentment or the envy or the pain or the fear is lighter somehow. Maybe it's still with you, but the poison of it is gone. And this change isn't necessarily dramatic. It can feel at first like the most subtle of shifts. Now, truth be told, there's something unsettling about all of this, about having that stone taken away. The mysterious angelic boy says to the women another great line, don't be afraid. Don't worry about that earthquake that so frightened the guards of the tomb that they are fallen down dead in front of you. That's that, you know, we could stage this as a comedy. But you know, in some ways, it's easier to live with the stone than without it. It's certainly safer. It's easier to stay behind the protection of all those things than to move beyond them and look at what lays ahead. That's why right at the top of our game, we are so prone to self-sabotage. Right at their peak, we are tempted to lay down our gifts. It's, it's safer. But life with Christ is never about safety. It's about freedom. The stone has been rolled away. And if you run, the angel says, if you run, you can catch up with the rest of your life. Now, now, this is a bit controversial, 
as it should be, resurrection is controversial. But not, I suggest to you, in the rather predictable ways we're inclined to line up on this or any other religious matter. You may have seen in yesterday's Washington Post a story picked up from the Religion News Service with the deliberately provocative title, Must a Christian Believe Literally in the Resurrection? Now, the, the author, the journalist, freelance writer Kimberly Winston, is a fine journalist, um, but writes in this article that this is now apparently the source of one of the deepest rifts in American Christianity. Well, as far as polarities go among us, and there are many, but as far as they go, I don't find this one between the literalist believers and the metaphorical believers particularly surprising, really all that interesting. Having spent significant time at virtually every point on the spectrum of Christian experience in this country, I'm not convinced that the things we imagine to be the most important to argue about are what truly make a difference in the life of a Christian. For there will always be people who are drawn to the concrete facts and nothing but the facts, and those who are drawn to the symbolic and the metaphorical meaning within or alongside those facts. There are those of us who trust truths that can be proven however we prove them, and those who prefer telling stories that also speak of truth, whether or not the stories ever took place. And we all gravitate toward the evidence and the arguments that shores up what we already think is true. But whatever, wherever you happen to find yourself on that literal, metaphorical spectrum, it's fine. Just remember, friends, that God shows no partiality. I may be wrong about this, but I'm not sure. God cares very much about this. I think God cares more about our experiences than our beliefs. Literally or metaphorically, what do you know about life after death? And what kind of person are you as a result? That's the question. Do you know what it feels like to have something or someone taken from you or part of yourself stripped from you? And then after what is surely death, to feel some kind of invitation to live again not, not the same life you had before, but a different one. And are you, because of this sojourn from death to life, a more compassionate person, less judgmental, willing to go where death still reigns because that's where Jesus is and that's where Jesus needs you for another person's sake? And if you're not willing, why not? Look around. There's some urgency to Jesus' work in the world around us. You know, there are four different versions of the Easter story in the Bible. One at the end of each gospel, each with its own perspective and story to tell. And I urge you to take some time this week to read them all would take about half an hour, and see which one, if any, speaks to you. What they have in common is the arc of emotion. Each begins in grief and ends in some combination of fear and joy. There is chaos in every tomb scene, lots of people running back and forth, Jesus appearing and disappearing, not always being recognized. And in each, the women are instructed not to stay at the tomb because Jesus isn't there anymore. What's noteworthy about the version printed in your Easter bulletin today 
is the sense of urgency. Things are happening suddenly and dramatically, and the angel keeps telling the women to hurry up. Quick, look around if you must, but go. Tell the others. He's not here. He's waiting for you in Galilee. Then as they're leaving, Jesus shows up, says basically the same thing, and off the women run in search of their comrades out of breath, telling them, we have to go to Galilee. Now, pondering that, I'm wondering about urgency. Urgency, where the clock is ticking for us, for all of us, personally, as a people, as a species. Where is Galilee? A lot rests on where we think we're meant to go. For Christians, this is the great story. This is the one that really matters. One final thought, geographically speaking. Geographically speaking, it's a long journey from Jerusalem to Galilee. On foot, you'd take about three days. But from the way the angel is talking to the two Marys, you'd think Galilee was right around the corner. Go quickly, he's right in Galilee, right over there, and he wants to meet you. And in the very next scene, they're all there. I'm just pointing out that both in geographic and perhaps spiritual terms, that movement from death to life might take a little while. But remember as you go, that God loves you with an everlasting love. God's love is a long distance runner with more wind capacity than anyone else in the race. Remember that God shows no partiality. We don't earn this journey and we don't make it happen. It is God's and remember that the end of the story is not in our hands. And as fabulous as we are or wish we could be or think we ought to be, this is a very good thing. The ending may not be happy in a simplistic way, but the ending is really, really good. That stone that's been in your way, weighing you down, it's gone now. It's gone. So take one more look around just to be sure, but then hurry. Run if you can. The rest of your life is up ahead. And Jesus is already there. It's waiting for you. It's waiting for all of us to arrive. Amen.